this is going to be the book of 1 Kings. And Revelation 5.10 says, And hast made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. So if you're saved, you're a king. And you need to take some characteristics from these kings and make those your own characteristics. And then you need to learn from their mistakes. And they got more mistakes than they've got anything. But 1 Kings covers the time from the death of David to the death of King Jehoshaphat. The book will show you the death of David, Solomon being crowned, and Solomon being made the wisest and wealthiest king in history. Also in this book, you're going to see the kingdom divided. And the 12 tribes of Israel were united, for the most part, under a single throne during the reign of Saul, David and Solomon. But after Solomon, they're divided. After the death of Solomon, 10 tribes break away to form the northern kingdom. And this northern kingdom is referred to as Israel. All of the kings from the kingdom, from this kingdom, most of them are extremely wicked. Then the other kingdom is made up of Judah and Benjamin. And the kings of this kingdom are successors and heirs of David. So kings and Samuel... The books of 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Samuel present history from the human standpoint, while Chronicles gives the same history from God's viewpoint. And 1st Kings has 22 chapters, 816 verses, and 24,524 words. The first 11 chapters of 1st Kings, Solomon and Israel's greatest time period ever is presented. In 12 through 22, you got the downfall of Israel. Now, to break it down a little bit further, chapters 1 through 3, Solomon's crowned king. Chapters 4 through 11, you got the stories of Solomon as king. Chapters 12 through 16, you got the dividing of the kingdom, and mainly stories about King Rehoboam, Jeroboam, and Asa. And then in chapters 17 through 22, you got Elijah the prophet, Ahab, and Jezebel. Now, chapter 1, David is an old man, and his son Adonijah exalts himself, but you're going to see David, David wants Solomon to reign. But the first thing we need to see is, if you're a king, you need to keep your kids in check. That's number one. Because in 1 Kings 1, 5 through 6, it says, Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, this is David's son, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen and fifty men to run before him. And his father had not displeased him at any time, saying, Why hast thou done so? And he also was a very goodly man, and his mother bare him after Absalom. So David had not displeased him. He wasn't saying, you know, why are you doing this? David didn't really keep his kids in check. Adonijah pictures the Antichrist who is trying to take a throne that isn't rightfully his. Isaiah 14, 13 shows you the devil wanted to take a throne that wasn't rightfully his. He said, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. And then 2 Thessalonians 2, 4, talking about the Antichrist, says, He opposeth, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. That's what Adonijah is picturing. And Adonijah is David's son. David needed to keep him in check. But the next thing, if you're a king, don't exalt yourself. <coughs> Excuse me. In 1 Kings 1 5, then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. And he prepared him chariots and horsemen. And 50 men run before him. Don't exalt yourself. Let somebody else exalt you. But Adonijah, he was not, he wouldn't, wasn't patient enough to wait to see if he was exalted. He wanted to go ahead and take the throne before the king was even dead. Number three, listen to the preacher. In 1 Kings 1, 11 through 14, it says, Wherefore Nathan spake unto Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Hast thou not heard that Adonijah, the son of Haggith, doth reign, and David our Lord knoweth it not? So Nathan comes to Bathsheba, 
David's wife, Solomon's mother, and informs her that Adonijah is reigning. And David doesn't even know about it. And he says, Now therefore come, let me, I pray thee, give thee counsel, that thou mayest save thine own life and the life of thy son Solomon. Go and get thee in unto King David, and say unto him, Didst thou not? Didst not thou, my lord, O king, swear unto thine handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit up on my throne? Why then doth Adonijah reign? Behold, while thou yet talkest there with the king, I also will come in after thee and confirm thy word. So this picture is how the woman will have to go home from church and relay the preacher's message to the husband because the husband doesn't listen to the preacher. If you're going to be a good king for the Lord, you're going to have to listen to the people that he's put in your life that's given you wisdom and knowledge and instruction. And number four, let the king exalt you. Don't exalt yourself. Let the king exalt you. Solomon didn't try to exalt himself to the throne. Adonijah did. Solomon waited for the king to do it. In 1 Kings one thirty. It says, And even as I swear unto thee by the Lord God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon, thy son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit upon my throne in my stead, even so will I certainly do this day. So David wants Solomon, and David exalts Solomon. Solomon waited to be exalted. And Matthew twenty three twelve says, And whosoever shall exalt himself shall be abased, and he that shall humble himself shall be exalted. Chapter 2. 1 Kings chapter 2, David gives instructions to Solomon. And you're going to see the death of David as well. But the fifth thing, if you're going to be a good king, you've got to go by the book. In 1 Kings 2 and verse 2 and 3, it says, I go the way of all the earth. Be thou strong, therefore, and show thyself a man. That's what David's telling to Solomon. He's telling him to be a man, show thyself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord thy God to walk in all his to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes and his commandments and his judgments and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that thou mayest prosper in all that thou doest, and whithersoever thou turnest thyself. So what you have with the Bible is the ultimate instruction manual, especially for a king. David's telling him to walk in the way, in the, his ways to keep his statutes and, and his commandments talking about the lord's commandments and his judgments and testimonies and deuteronomy seventeen eighteen says and it shall be when he sitteth upon the throne of his kingdom that he shall write him a copy of this law in a book out of that which is before the priests the levites so the king's supposed to write a copy of the book write it out memorize it study it Read it. Apply it. Go by the book. If you're going to be a good king, go by the book. Number six, if you're going to be a good king, know the enemy. Solomon is king now. And Adonijah attempts to take the throne again by taking Abishag, David's concubine, to be his wife. And he goes to Solomon's mother Bathsheba and he's like, please just... Request to Solomon that I can take Abishag to wife. And here is what Solomon answers. In 1 Kings 2.22, And King Solomon answered and said unto his mother, And why dost thou ask Abish, Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is mine elder brother, even for him, and for Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zer Zeruiah. Solomon knew that Adonijah was trying to get David's concubine so that he would get the throne. And this can picture how the devil attempts to get the bride. The devil wants, he can't get the bride, he can't get the members of the bride's soul, but he can get their testimony and ruin them when it comes to this world. And we don't need to be ignorant of the enemy, what he's trying to do. Solomon was not ignorant of Adonijah at all. He was very skeptical. He didn't trust him. And 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. If you're going to be a good king, you can't be ignorant of the enemy's devices. In chapter 3, Solomon asks for wisdom. 
So number seven, if you're going to be a good king, consistently pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. 1 Kings 3, 3, And Solomon loved the Lord, walking in the statutes of David his father. And 1 Kings 3, 7, And now, O Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David my father, and I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. So Solomon's coming to the Lord, and he is saying that he knows nothing. Stop thinking that you know something. You think you know something, but you actually know nothing. In 1 Kings 3, 9, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart to judge thy people, that I may discern between good and bad. For who is able to judge this, thou so great a people? And the speech pleased the Lord, that Solomon had asked this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou hast asked this thing, and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast asked riches for thyself, nor has asked the life of thine enemies, but has asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. Behold, I have done according to thy words. Lo, I have given thee a wise and an understanding heart, so that there was none like thee before thee, neither after thee shall any arise like unto thee. And I have also given thee that which thou hast not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like unto thee all thy days. And if thou wilt walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as thy father David did walk, then I will lengthen thy days." So Solomon asked for understanding. And he didn't ask for riches. If you're going to be a good king, you're going to have to constantly pray for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. Now, when you get to be a king in the millennium, you're going to have the mind of Christ. You're already going to have this stuff. But in terms of this life, walking on this earth, you want to have wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. And only God can give that to you. Solomon shows his wisdom with the two harlots and the baby in this same chapter. You see, two women come to Solomon. They both have a child. One of their child dies, and another one is alive. Now they're fighting over who the remaining child belongs to. And in 1 Kings three twenty six and 27, Then spake the woman whose the living child was unto the king, for her bowels yearned upon her son, and she said, O oh my Lord, give her the living child, and in no wise slay it. But the other said, let it, neither be, let it be neither mine nor thine, but divide it. This is because Solomon said, Bring me a sword. And he said, Okay, I'm going to take the child, and I'm going to cut him in half. You have one half, and you have the other half. And the, the real mother said, No, no, just give her the child. Don't kill it. But the other one said, okay, go ahead and divide it. I'll take one half. She'll take the other half. And this showed Solomon that the living child belonged to the mother that didn't want the baby to die. So this shows that natural affection for a mother is for her child to live even if she can't have it. Not to kill it. Not to abort it. And, you know, Solomon got a lot of fame because of this story. Because of his wisdom. And then in chapter 4, Solomon is wiser than all men and writes 3,000 proverbs. In 1 Kings 4, 29 through 31, And God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding, exceeding much and largeness of heart, even as the sand that is on the seashore. And Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east country and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men. So he was wiser than all men. And he wrote 3,000 proverbs in 1 Kings 4, 32 and 33. And he spake 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a 1,005. And he spake of trees from the cedar tree that is in Lebanon, even unto all the hyssop that springeth out of the wall. He spake also of beasts and of fowl and creeping things and of fishes. So he wrote 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were a 1,005. If you're going to be a good king, write something that will go beyond your life. We're still reading Solomon's writings today. Surely you can write something, whether it be in your Bible, on notebook paper, on a computer, or even record your voice, and let that be something that's going to go beyond your life that maybe your kids have. I mean, I, all these things that I do on here, I have, I've kept, and my kids can have them. When, when I'm gone, they can go back 
listen to it, read it, get something out of it. I've got several Bibles that are marked up. I hope that they will get a hold of those, look at those, read them. Write something that's going to go beyond your life. And that's how you redeem the time. And then you kind of live on. Wisdom that you picked up on kind of lives on after you're gone. And maybe your kids can pick up on it. But that brings me to the next point. Number nine, have some wisdom to impart to others. If you don't get some wisdom, then you're not going to have any to pass on to anybody. And I've noticed the older men that I talk to nowadays don't even have any wisdom to to give on to people. And I'm looking to them. You know, I see a, a 50-something-year-old, 60, 70, and I, I talk to them and I think, well, I can learn from this person. You know, they've been through a lot. And they're older than me. I can learn from this person. And then they don't give me any wisdom. They're giving me unbiblical advice. And I'm thinking, where's your wisdom? What have you been doing all this time? So you need to have, number nine, have some wisdom to impart to others. You're going to have to get in the Bible. You're going to have to get in a Christian service to where you can get experience and learn some things. In 1 Kings 4.34, and there came... Of all people to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth which had heard his of his wisdom. Now this pictures people coming to hear Jesus Christ in the millennium to to hear his wisdom. Then in chapter five, Solomon makes a league with Hiram, and he has rest on every side. And that also pictures Jesus Christ reigning the millennium. He's gonna have rest. There's gonna be peace, complete peace. It says in 1 Kings 5, 4, But now the Lord my God hath given me rest on every side, so that there is neither adversary nor evil occurrent. And number 10, if you're going to be a good king, be at peace. You can't have peace like Solomon had it in the sense that you're not going to have fights and wars and things like that. But you can have peace in your heart because you know that God's going to take care of you and he's your hope. Isaiah 26, 3 says, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. And the peace of God passeth all understanding. You already got peace with God at salvation. Now you need the peace of God. And you're not going to get that worrying about the things that's going on in this world. A lot of Christians have started doing that. They're worried about the things going on in this world. And it keeps them in fear. That stuff's going to pass, and there's going to be another worry a few years from now. Then a few years after that, there's going to be a whole different event for people to worry about. But the Bible stays the same. It's always there. Chapter 6, Solomon build, begins to build the house of the Lord. So number 11, if you're going to be a good king, begin building. And 1 Corinthians three eleven through 15 shows you that if you're saved, you see, the moment you got saved, you started a building. And you're building with some type of material. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, what are you building with? You're building with gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. So what are you building? What you're building is going to have to go through a fire one day. And if the works you did were good, with the right motive then it's going to make it through the fire and you're going to get a reward for it. Solomon begins to build the house of the Lord. He did a good thing. He's going to get rewarded for that. What are you building? When you started your salvation journey, after your salvation, you started building something. What have you been building with? Have you been even doing any good works for the Lord? And have you been doing good works with the right motive? In chapter 7, Solomon builds his house and houses for his wives. This brings me to the next point. Don't spend more time building your own stuff than you do the Lord's. Because Solomon 
In verse 1 of chapter 7, it says, But Solomon was building his own house 13 years. For 13 years, he built his own house. And he only spent seven on the Lord's. So he almost spent double on his own. So that reminds me, don't spend more time fulfilling the desires of your flesh and your wants more than you do the Lord's. Philippians 2, 4 says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And that's significant. He spent 13 years on his own house. 13 is the number of rebellion. And as you know, Solomon starts to slowly stray from God. In chapter 8, Solomon brings the ark into the house. And today, the temple is your body. Solomon brought the ark into the t t physical temple that was a building. Today, the temple is your body. So this brings me to the next point. Glorify God in your body. And 1 Corinthians six nineteen through 20 What know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not a, your own? For ye are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. If you're going to glorify God in your body, then you're going to have to be in the Word so that it can mold you to be like Jesus Christ. Solomon took that Ark of the Covenant into the temple. And inside that Ark of the Covenant has the Ten Commandments. You need to be taking God's commandments and putting them in you, in your body. That way you'll know what to do. That way you'll know how to make the right decisions. And you don't want to do anything to this body that would defile it. Or make people think that it isn't a temple of the Holy Ghost. Chapter 9, you're going to see David is the standard for kings. That's who God judges all the kings by is David. It says in 1 Kings 9, 4, And if thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness to do according to all that I have commanded thee and will keep my statutes and judgments. But notice he said, If thou wilt walk before me as David thy father walked. The same way David is the standard for these kings. Jesus Christ is our standard. And David is a picture of the Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ is our standard. We should be trying to mold our life to be like him. Chapter 10. You got the Queen of Sheba coming to Solomon. Going to ask him hard questions. And number 14. We also should be ready to give an answer. In 1 Peter 3.15 it says, But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts, and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. I need to know enough Bible and have enough wisdom and knowledge and understanding to give an answer to every man that asks me a question about the Bible and about the Lord Jesus. But the Queen of Sheba comes to prove him with hard questions. And 1 Kings 10, 1 through 3. And Solomon is able to answer all her questions. And she, be she believes the report about him that he really is the wisest man in the world. Now in 1 Kings 10, 14, it says, Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in, in one year was 603 score and six talents of gold. So 666 talents of gold. Solomon begins to be a picture of the Antichrist. And now he's connected with the number 666. And in 1 Kings 10, 20, it says, And twelve lions stood there on the one side, and on the other side upon the six steps as well. So he had six lions on both sides of his throne. And then he had six steps going up to it. So that made a 666. So he starts being associated with the number 666, with the number 13. And now you're going to see in chapter 11, his real rebellion, when he takes all these strange wives. In chapter 11, Solomon's strange wives. And if you're going to be a king, don't let people hinder your walk. Solomon's wives began to sit on the throne of his heart. And this started the downfall of Israel. In 1 Kings 11, 1 through 6, it says, But King Solomon loved many strange women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Azadonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go in to them, neither shall they come in unto you. 
for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon clave unto these in love, and he had six hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines. And his wives turned away his heart, for it came to pass when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Zidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. And Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord, and went not fully after the Lord, as did David his father. When you get astray from the Lord, God's going to stir up an adversary against you, most likely. Just like he did Solomon in 1 Kings eleven fourteen, And the Lord stirred up an adversary unto Solomon, Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. So the Lord raises up another thorn in the side to Solomon and his sons, which would be Jeroboam as well. Solomon had chosen Jeroboam to be a ruler under him. But Ahijah, the prophet, tells Solomon's servant Jeroboam that he will get the northern part of the kingdom, which is made up of the twelve tribes, the ten, made up of the ten, ten of the twelve tribes. And so in 1 Kings 11.40, Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, and Jeroboam arose and fled into Egypt, and the Shishak king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. So Solomon gets away from the Lord because of these strange wives, and the Lord raises up an adversary against him, Hadad the Edomite and Jeroboam. And now we're going to get into these kings, these different kings that come during the divided kingdom. In chapter 12, you have the story of King Rehoboam and the dividing of the kingdom. And this brings me to the next point is if you're going to be a good king, you're going to have to take wise counsel, which is which is something that King Rehoboam didn't do. He goes to the old men to ask them what he should do as king. And it says in 1 Kings 12, 6 through 7, And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be thy servants forever. But Rehoboam didn't go by this advice. He forsakes wise counsel from the old men. And he listens to the young men who grew up with him. And their advice was to make it harder on the people. But this caused the people to revolt and split. And this caused the kingdom to be divided. And this causes Jeroboam to be made king over Israel. And eventually he invents a false religion. So you're going to have Rehoboam over the two southern tribes and Jeroboam over the ten northern tribes. And in 1 Kings 20, 20 through 21, And it came to pass when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was come again, that they sent and called him unto the congregation and made him king over all Israel. And there was none that followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. And that's who's going to be under Rehoboam. And when Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah with the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and fourscore thousand chosen men, which were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. So from here on, you have a, you have a divided kingdom. The two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, which is referred to simply as Judah, are under Rehoboam, and the other ten tribes are under Jeroboam, which is simply just going to be called Israel. So you'll see Rehoboam and the kings after him called the kings of Judah. And you'll see Jeroboam and the kings after him called the kings of Israel. Now chapter 13, you got Jeroboam versus this unnamed man of God. And Jeroboam gets his arms dried up and healed and everything in this crazy story. But the man of God also ends up disobeying the Lord. And uh, he actually takes an old man's counsel when he shouldn't have. You see, you had a, a story in chapter 11, uh, 11 where King Rehoboam should have took the advice of the old men. Well, that was in chapter 12, actually. He should have took the advice of the old men. And then uh, in chapter 13, you have this young prophet that shouldn't have took the advice of an old man. So it's not always right to take the advice of the old man. But as a general rule, you want to go by what the old man says over what the young man said. But as a 100% rule, you want to take the advice of what the Word of God said over the old man and the young man. So there's a line of authority you go by. Chapter 14, Jeroboam and his wife seek truth 
from Ahijah. And there is one good thing you can say about Jeroboam. He knows where to go for truth. So number 17, if you're going to be a good king, you need to know where to go for truth. If you're going to have... If you're going to live a victorious Christian life, then you're going to have to know where to go for truth. Which Bible, which preacher, which friend, which mentor have a Bible library made up of Bible-believing authors have some truth you can go to. But Ahijah is the truth that Jeroboam goes to, him and his wife. And Ahijah prophesies the death of their child, and they mourn after his death. And if Jeroboam, the wicked king, and his wicked wife mourn after the death of their child, this shows they have a natural affection for children. That's something you need. That's something that we're lacking today. Uh, parents don't want their children, and if they don't abort them, they don't even care for them. They let them do whatever. But Rehoboam does evil in the sight of the Lord. In 1 Kings 14, 22 through 24, just like Jeroboam, and it says, And Judah did evil in the sight of the Lord, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they had committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places, and images, and groves on every high hill, and under every green tree. And there were also Sodomites in the land. And they did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord cast out before the children of Israel. So, these kings are just messing up. You mostly learn what not to do by reading about them. In chapter 15, you got several kings mentioned. You got Ab Ab Abijam, or Abijam, Asa, Baasha, Nadab, and Jehoshaphat. But number 18, if you're going to be a good king, you need to do better than your fathers. You're going to find that most kings follow their fathers and their evil deeds. And it doesn't have to be this way. You can break the cycle. In 1 Kings 15, 1 through 3, it says, Now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, reigned Abijam over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom, that was his, which is Absalom. And he walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with the Lord his God, as the heart of David his father. Your son will probably be just as bad as you or worse than you. And you want to break the cycle. You don't want to be just like your father if he was a bad guy. You can break the cycle. You can be different. You don't have to walk in all the sins of your father. But finally, we come to a good king, King Asa, in 1 Kings 15, 9 through 11. And notice a characteristic of a good king. In 1 Kings 15, 12, it's talking about Asa, and it says, And he took away the Sodomites out of the land and removed all the idols that his father had made. So he took away the homosexuals out of the land. So number 19, take the biblical view on love and marriage. Asa did better than many of his fathers and mothers, and he and remove, had to remove his mother from being queen in 1 Kings 15.3 because she had made an idol in a grove. And Asa destroyed her idol and burned it by the brook Kidron. So Asa had the proper view on marriage. He knew marriage should be between a man and a woman. He knew there shouldn't be sodomites. He shouldn't be going along with the sodomites and having a soft spot in his heart for that sin because that's a that's a, an attack on the family. You see, they want people to be sodomites because it destroys the family. You would no longer have a man and a woman and a child, it would be a woman and a woman and a child, or a man and a man and a child. A child needs a mother, and a child needs a father. That's how you create balanced, right-minded people. But it says in 1 Kings fifteen twenty three, Nevertheless, in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. Asa was diseased in his feet. This pictures your walk with the Lord. Are you going to finish your course? Or are you going to end your life diseased in your feet? Now, Nadab does evil like his father Jeroboam. Nadab is the next one to reign in 1 Kings fifteen twenty five. And Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah, and reigned over Israel two years. And he did evil in the sight of the Lord and walked in the way of his father and in his sin wherewith he made Israel to sin. And then Nadab dies at the hand of Baasha. Basha conspires against him and kills him. And these guys are just getting killed. They're just killing each other back and forth 
to take the crown from each other. See, they're, they're worried about trying to be the greatest. Don't worry about trying to be the greatest. Let God exalt you. You worry about making Jesus great, and Jesus will make you great. Then chapter 16, you got Kings Baasha, Elah, Zimri, Omri, and Ahab. And in 1 Kings 16, 8 and 9, it says, In the twenty and sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel in Tirzah two years. And his servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him as he was in Tirzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, steward of his house in Tirzah. So, this guy Elah, King Elah, is drinking. And if he hadn't been drinking, then he wouldn't have died. So number 20, if you're going to be a good king, you need to lay off the alcohol. Because in Proverbs 31, 4, it says, It is not for kings, O Lemuel. It is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. Kings aren't supposed to drink. And if you're saved, you're a king for the Lord. So you need to quit drinking. 1 Peter 4, 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. Since Elah was drinking, he ends up dead. Zimri went in and smote him and killed him. And Zimri killed him, but now Zimri dies himself. He just reigns just like not even that, a month. Omri hears what happened and goes after him in, himself. And it says in 1 Kings sixteen seventeen through 18, And Omri went up from Gibeathan, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Tirzah. And it came to pass when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the palace of the king's house and burnt the king's house over him with fire and died. So Omri takes his place, but he doesn't do much better. And that brings me to the next point. If you're going to be a good king, you need to learn from the mistakes of others. None of these guys learn from each other's mistakes. They do the same stupid stuff. In 1 Kings sixteen twenty-five through 30, it says, But Omri wrought evil in the eyes of the Lord and did worse than all that were before him. And in 1 Kings 16, 30, And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. Have you ever heard somebody say, Who's the baddest? Who's the biggest? And me? Who's the meanest? It's like they pride themselves in being m more worse than somebody else, more wicked than somebody else. None of them are learning from the mistakes of others. They want to be worse. In 1 Kings 16, 31, it came to pass as if it had been a light thing for him to walk on the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbel, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. So, they just get worse. They don't learn from each other's mistakes. And then in chapter 17 through 19, you got the great stories of Elijah versus Ahab. Chapter 20, you got Ahab versus Benadad. Chapter 21, you got Naboth and his vineyard. Chapter 22, you got Micaiah, and he's a good prophet. Just in chapter 21, something you need to do is watch out for covetousness. Ahab is king of covetousness. You need to make sure that you're not concerned with the things of this world so much that it's going to make you quit thinking about the things of God. You're going to become covetousness. Covetous. But this has just been a quick little lesson. Some points to maybe help you be a better king for the Lord.